Today we're talking about the best settings for wedding photography. Keep waving. This is good stuff, man. Welcome to a new day of the 30 day course. If you're not subscribed to the channel, subscribe. We're doing a new wedding photography video every single day of the month with the exception of Mondays, which a film photography video comes out on. As you may or may not know, if you saw last week, the, uh, the sponsor of these videos is Focal. Uh, Focal is a company that set up my new website and it's super easy. You have a video call with them and you tell them what you like about your website. If you have a website right now, you give them some examples, some things you'd like, and they come at you with a first draft. They write copy for you. They put your packages together uh, with all of the best practices in mind, including SEO, uh, search engine optimization, which is a thing that I had to learn a lot about, and uh, they just kind of do everything for you. Beyond that, the website also comes with a full proper backend specifically built for photographers. So when people come to your website, they inquire, they can use the availability calendar if they want. They submit the request to see if you're available. You can do the contract, you can do the booking, you can do credit card payments through Focal, as well as you get entered into the marketplace as well. So the marketplace is basically where your packages can live in a place that is already ranking on Google. So if somebody's typing in wedding photographer in whatever your city is, there's a pretty good chance those packages are going to pop up and they're going to find you. And they're going to book you and you're going to make lots of money and you're going to have unlimited pizzas in your life. That's what I wish for you. Today, we're talking about wedding photography settings. Uh, I'm going to begin this with the setup. So basically how you set up your camera, uh, followed by the actual, I guess, the settings that I'm using on a wedding day as far as aperture and shutter speeds and everything go. Uh, so when I first get a brand new camera out of the box, we're going to use the Canon R6 as the example here, but this should be cross-platform. Uh, the menu options, obviously a little bit different, but everything should be the same. The first thing you want to do is make sure that your camera is set to raw. And if you're not familiar with what raw is, uh, a lot of cameras will come default JPEG only. JPEG's great uh, if you're sending photos to your phone to upload to social media. It's not so good if you're at a wedding day and you're dealing with a lot of high contrast environments such as a dark suit or a bright dress maybe out in the sun. On a JPEG, basically if you go above what uh, is visible within the photo, so say you get a little bit too bright and the whites of a wedding dress uh, become a pure white, you can't actually recover that, that that is just gone forever. Whereas if you're shooting with raw, there is a chance that as long as you don't blow it too much, uh, that you should be able to recover that. Same goes with shadows as well, that if you uh, are taking photos, uh, I suffer from this myself in dark environments that whenever I'm at a reception, I'm doing photos. The photos here just, they seem brighter when the ambient is is dark. And then I get back to my computer, I'm like, ah, everything's about like a stop underexposed. And when you're shooting raw, it's no problem. You can just bump that up. So the first step, set your camera to raw. There might be a few different settings for what a raw file looks like and maybe look it up uh, your specific camera. Uh, if you're shooting something like this Canon R6 that is a 20 megapixel file, I have no problem shooting the full size raw file. That's fine by me. If I was shooting something like the Canon R5 that has 40 plus or 46 megapixels, I think, at that point, I might consider shooting C-RAW, which is a more compressed RAW version. Uh, Nikon has this on the, the new Z9. There's a bunch of different options. Um, Sony, I'm not too sure. So maybe look that up if you're a Sony shooter. And if you're shooting Fuji, you're in pretty good shape because they, uh, I guess unless you're shooting one of the medium format bodies, uh, you already shoot a good number of megapixels for a wedding day. Um, to briefly speak about it, the megapixels that I find personally ideal for a wedding day, anywhere between kind of like 18, 19, up to 24. I don't really need above that. Uh, if I am shooting something that requires 45 megapixels, usually it's landscape photography or it's commercial photography. And I know that going in wedding day, so much of the coverage is documentary that they're never going to be blowing up a photo on their wall. Maybe they will. I don't know. But like with a 24 megapixel file, you can probably go up to about six feet of a good quality close viewing distance, surprisingly. Um, also, if you master them for large print. Um, so don't worry about anyone ever printing larger than that. I feel like it would be pretty weird to go into somebody's home and they have a wedding photo that is six feet at a close viewing distance. Um, right, It's life size at that point. Uh, if they are printing something that large as like a banner <laughs> trade show, I don't know what, the, what they would do with a larger print. Usually the viewing distance is a little bit further, so you don't actually have to print it as high of DPI. For the example of a billboard, a billboard, I'll look it up right now. I feel like a billboard file is like um, 3.2 megapixels or something like that. So according to a few of these articles, to print a billboard, you need a two megapixel camera because the viewing distance is so far that even if the pixels are that large, um, that you're still going to be able to see the full picture. So don't worry about getting a camera that has 45 megapixels for wedding photography. The next settings that I change, uh, this will depend a little bit more on your camera. If you're shooting mirrorless, 
I am a lot more comfortable, I guess, just letting the camera do almost full automatic detection. So I put it on face detect, set up a button to disable eye detect if you're able to do that. Just be, if you find yourself in an environment where it's just not doing exactly what you want or there's a face in the frame that you don't actually want to focus on. The easy example is that the ring exchange at the front of a, of a wedding um, that usually the priest's face is kind of like hiding in the back there and your face detect is going to want to focus on, on that person rather than on the hands or the rings that you're trying to focus on. And if you're on digital SLR, I am still mostly comfortable s shooting single point. So I, I'm not shooting just letting the camera do whatever it wants. I'm usually locking a single point or maybe doing some 3D tracking depending on the scene. Um, there's a lot more that you can get into as far as autofocus goes, but I find that the easiest way to learn about it is just go out, see what your camera does, what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy, what you think it could do better, and then watch some videos that either fill in those gaps or give you some advanced settings depending on which camera you're with. I shoot my cameras on servo mode on my Canon R6's servo mode on Nikon. It's, uh, I guess, AF hyphen C. And basically what that means is that if I have my finger half pressing the shutter. Um, I use front button focus. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, if I'm half pressing the shutter and you're moving towards me or away, that it's going to continue to autofocus with you. Uh, if you're on one shot or AFS, uh, it's a little more, I would say, for landscape photography or maybe street photography when you want to set that focus point. And then the subject is going to walk into it or you just want to make sure that you are crisply in focus uh, on the landscape that you're shooting. What that means is that it sets a focus point for you and it's not going to track with the subject, even if it identifies that there is a subject in the scene. For the drive mode, which is basically how many frames per second your camera will take, I have shot most of my years on single frame that I have to hit the button in order to take a picture that I don't have it on high frame rate. Uh, I, I could see maybe this being important for the first kiss, but I am fine to just hit the button a bunch of times, uh, knowing that I'm not going to be burning a bunch of frames. If you've ever shot a high frame rate camera and you have it on high or high plus, you'll know that it's almost impossible to hit one single frame that is, as soon as you hold down the shutter, you're taking two or three, which is maybe nice in family formal environments that you're getting. If people are blinking, you're going to get those frames beside it. Uh, so you're able to go to the next frame rather than uh, photoshopping faces. But for the most part, I am shooting on single frame. Uh, again, season to taste if this is what you enjoy or maybe that low frame rate. Um, a thing that comes up often is like, how many frames per second does my wedding photography camera need? And the truth is that I would say four, maybe five maximum. And that's pretty much only for if there's fast movement happening or the first kiss, or maybe you're doing a little uh, spin or something like that. Uh, this I believe shoots 20 frames per second, which is probably too much. It's good for snowboarding, but kind of unnecessary for weddings. So uh, I leave it on single most of the day. Next up, metering mode. Uh, this isn't really as important on mirrorless. So I'm shooting manual settings. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, I'm shooting manual all the time and you just see exactly the image you're taking. So it's no problem at all. If you are on digital SLR and you're using your meter to, to make sure you're in the ballpark of what you want, I had a tendency just to leave it on full matrix. So just fully understanding the whole scene and then doing test frames to adjust from there. Other common metering, uh, I did this when I was beginning and I wasn't shooting raw, but definitely be shooting raw. I would actually be on spot metering. So I would make sure that whoever the face was, usually somebody's backlit or they're in the shade and I didn't want the camera to expose for the entire scene. This was also when I was shooting aperture priority, um, which I, I don't know, you can shoot it if you want, but uh, manual I feel like is so easy, these mirrorless cameras. When it comes to white balance, a lot of the cameras are very, very good on auto white balance. What I find specifically for wedding days is that the white balance will take into account the entire scene and not the human being in it. And what I like to do is I actually lock my white balance to typically cloud mode, uh, cloudy mode. On Nikon, I shot the shade mode, which is the house with the, the lines beside it. And I do this simply because usually the person is in the shade that I, if I'm photographing them, typically the person is in the shade and I want their skin tone to be correct for the environment that they're in. If they're standing underneath a tree and you're letting the camera decide, it's going to be like, oh, this is a daylight scene. So it's going to cool it down and the person's going to be a little bit more blue than they should be. Whereas when you set it to shade mode, uh, all of a sudden they have a more correct skin tone. Um, obviously season to taste if this isn't what you, if you don't like those warm skin tones, if you like something a little bit cooler, um, by all means run auto or run daylight. But I have personally found that most of the wedding day, I would say 80% of the wedding day. I'm typically on shade even when I'm outside in the sun. Uh, the only time that I typically change it is I'll go to incandescent or fluorescent mode uh, whenever I do go inside into the reception. Uh, if you're using a flash, we'll talk more about this in the off-camera flash video, uh, you can use a flash gel. So your flash as it is here, this is kind of balanced for daylight um, as it just is 
bare bulb. Um, you can get either little adapters or MagMod clips or whatever it might be, or you can just use literally, you can tape a gel uh, on here as well. Um, something that's an orange, or if you're trying to match fluorescent lights, sometimes it's more of a green. Um, but again, we'll talk a little bit more about that another video. Another thing to mention with white balance is that if you are shooting raw, you have full ability to control it afterwards. So when you get into Lightroom, you can just make your white balance whatever you want. Uh, what I have personally discovered is that it speeds up your workflow a little bit. And if you're outsourcing, it gives people a better idea of kind of the image that you're trying to achieve uh, by shooting it as correct as you can in camera. So I would say there's no real harm in setting that as a manual setting. It takes a couple of seconds and it'll save you many, many seconds in post-production. And then also it gets you, if you're sending photos to your phone to post throughout the wedding day, you'll be a lot closer with the JPEG as well. Next up, picture styles. For picture styles, I am on standard most of the time. There's usually an automatic mode. I prefer just to leave it on standard. If uh, basically what it's doing is it's controlling just your JPEG, uh, in w at least what my, my knowledge right now is that the picture style doesn't actually write anything to the raw file, which you will eventually be editing from, that it basically any of the modifications that it do are JPEG only. So the JPEG preview you're seeing or the JPEG that you're sending to your phone, they will be affected by the picture style, but the picture style does not affect the raw file. I know uh, on Fuji, certain things do actually write to the raw file, such as lens corrections. So um, make sure you look into the manual or you watch a few videos for your specific camera. Uh, for Nikon, whenever I'm shooting any of my Nikon cameras, I have D lighting set to usually high or extra high. And what that does is it basically bumps up the shadows and uh, doesn't let you blow out the highlights as easily. Uh, the negative is that it will, um, it doesn't really change the raw file, but because it's showing you a JPEG preview that is a little bit more processed, um, you're typically, if you're shooting high, you're maybe three quarters of a stop under as far as lighting goes. So the image that you're going to see in the raw is just a lot darker, um, but you're seeing the JPEG preview that's a little bit brighter. So be careful and be aware of that if uh, it is something that you want to do. As far as other settings go, if it's possible on your camera system, I like to set up a button, um, one of the front function buttons, to go into crop mode. So I do this with all of my Nikon cameras. And basically all it does is it allows you to go from full frame mode into crop mode. So if you're shooting a full frame camera, uh, you can go into that 1.5 times mode, uh, which basically allows you to zoom in a little bit more. So if you're shooting 85, it, the 85 becomes, I, I don't know what the math is, a 1. 36.5 millimeter lens or something like that, maybe 132. I've done the math in the past, but it basically allows you to get a little bit more reach. This is incredibly helpful when it comes to video because the video file that you're shooting, you're still going to be shooting the full HD frame or the full 4K frame. Whereas with photos, whenever you do go into crop mode, you lose a little bit of resolution. I don't remember what the official numbers are. I feel like on my Nikon camera, if it's a 24 megapixel camera, the crop sensor file will be 11 megapixels. So uh, don't use it for everything, but whenever you need that extra reach. It is nice to have. You could also just shoot it full wide and crop in post-production, but again, might as well get it as correct as you can in camera. Uh, when it comes to video though, it is a little bit more important, but you're here for the wedding photography. So let's not talk too much about video. For actual photography settings, I use manual mode all the time. Uh, I will maybe use aperture priority mode if it's a variable cloudy day and the clouds are moving very fast and People are going from bright sun to, to cloudy to bright sun and back and forth. Um, otherwise, I'm always on manual. It's very, very easy to shoot manual with a mirrorless camera because you're just seeing the image that you're taking. So the learning curve really just is completely flattened. When you're shooting digital SLR, you kind of have to like get kind of close, verify with your meter, take a test frame, and you're like, oh, I'm way under, I need to change that. With uh, mirrorless, you just kind of see what you're taking. So it's a heck of a lot easier. One thing to be aware of in manual mode is your shutter speed. Make sure your shutter speed is up to a point that is going to freeze motion and or not let your camera shake too much. Um, daytime, you're probably not gonna run into this as a problem. When you get into the reception and things get a little bit darker, I do have a tendency to see my shutter speed creeping down. And as soon as I get, if I'm on an 85 millimeter lens, the ideal is that you're shooting a shutter speed that is as fast as your lens or higher. So if you're shooting an 85 millimeter lens, you wanna be at one slash 85th of a second or higher. Um, this also, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in other videos, but there are some instances when you get into a place that if they're using LED lights and they're on a dimmer and they shouldn't be, that they'll flicker and the refresh will be really weird and it'll be around one slash 40th of a second. So in order to have all the lights on in the room when you take the photo, you have to go and break that rule a little bit, but that's uh, an advanced thing that doesn't really happen all of the time, but I do see it happening more and more at each wedding. Another benefit of shooting manual, again, when it comes to post-production is that you have everything consistent. So family formals, for instance, 
you have everything and you can do a batch correction. So say everything is maybe a little bit underexposed and you want to make everything kind of the same. All of a sudden you can select all of the photos and hit one button rather than going through and individually adjusting each one in order to make sure that they look the same as the one before it. Um, a small thing, but I feel like in the final gallery, it really does make for a better experience when the exposures aren't bumping all over the place. And same goes with white balance as well that, um, again, you can sync this in post-production if you want, but by just shooting it correctly on the day, uh, again, you can do those incremental adjustments. If everything's a little bit too warm, cool it down with one button and you can select the entire batch or warm it up kind of all together. To talk briefly about a thing called back button focus, you may see this on the internet and people are really kind of diehard about it if they are. What essentially it used to be was that to have proper autofocus, it was important to be in full control of that and back button would mean that the AF on button Whenever you're touching that button or holding that button down, the autofocus is activated and the autofocus does not function whenever you hit the shutter button. So they're completely independent of one another that you're tracking with autofocus and then you're using the shutter as an independent thing to capture the photo. And I do like the separation of process, but what I've found, especially with mirrorless cameras, is that the autofocus is just so good that you don't need that anymore. So unless it's something that's just in your brain that you can't break out of, I don't think that there's a reason to use it, uh, especially for wedding photography in the current year. Um, going back a bunch of years, maybe it was useful, beneficial, and if you learn that way, it's very, very hard to break the habit of back button focus. But if you're just learning now and it's not ingrained in your muscle memory, uh, I would say don't worry too much about learning that, that it's uh, it's a neat thing, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a fun challenge to learn, but end of the day, you're going to be able to get equally as good work um, just with single button half press autofocus um, with a camera maybe like this Canon R6 or any of the newer mirrorless cameras. When it comes to how I actually set up the dials on my camera, uh, I left them on this Canon R6. They come default to a way that's different than what I do on my Nikon system. So the front wheel here is set to shutter speed. Usually I have my front wheel up here also set to shutter speed regardless of what system I'm on. The back wheel here on my Nikon system is actually set to aperture. So I'm changing the aperture, the f-stop with this. What I've realized with how good the autofocus is in mirrorless cameras is that I don't need to use the aperture nearly as much as I used to. I used to basically, if I'm in a scene and I'm a little bit nervous about making sure everything's in focus, I would maybe bring my f-stop down to maybe f2 or f2.8 if I'm shooting something like this 1.4 lens. What I've realized is that now I just kind of set it all day at 1.4, unless I have a reason to change it. Uh, so I've gone to the Canon default now where the aperture is actually on the back wheel here. And my ISO is actually this uh, top wheel up here. So shutter speed in the front, ISO in the back here, and aperture on this wheel, because I'm just touching this by far the least. I feel like this is also maybe if you're interested in shooting video, um, it's better practice, I would say, overall to be adjusting your ISO rather than your shutter speed and your aperture all the time, um, especially with the fact that I cannot tell the difference between the ISOs from, I would say, up to about 10,000. Even at 10,000, uh, I still really if you're properly exposed, I, I don't see a whole lot of difference between the, the lower ISOs, which is really crazy. So yeah, front wheel, whether it's up top here or on the actual front of your camera, I have that set to shutter speed, ISO up top here, and aperture in the back. But again, there is no official real or correct way to do this. That's whatever feels the most comfortable for you. And I've just found that that works the best for me uh, in this current year. So those are all of my settings on this camera. Let's go to a real wedding day and I'll talk a little bit about what I do in different situations. All right, here we are in a gallery. I posted this full wedding day a few months ago now. And I figured that we should just go through the highlights of it. Uh, it's through a bunch of different situations, as you can see down here, covered ceremony space with some dark wood, some actual interior with uh, bounce flash, as well as, uh, I guess, some, some evening time fluorescence. So let us begin. What you'll see up here in this corner are all of my settings. Um, I will scroll down a little bit so you can see absolutely everything. And the lens is right here. ISO, aperture, shutter speed. And it's not gonna tell you white balance. It's an, an exported JPEG, sorry. I will uh, try to clarify that for you. Most of the time, say for instance, this shot, I would have shot it on um, either shade white balance or auto white balance. Uh, both are kind of equally good, I would say, in a situation like this. Whenever, as I mentioned kind of in the earlier video, whenever I am in a space that I actually have to take photos of people, I usually am exposing my white balance specifically for their skin tones. So if it is uh, a shady day, I will likely just lock my camera to shade. So there's no question for the camera to try to interpret what I want it to do when I can just tell it what to do and make it easy. 
So this one here, um, aperture 2.2. So this is an F 1.8 lens. So wide open, it shoots at F 1.8. I stop it down just a little bit uh, wide open. Honestly, it's the 50. It's an incredible lens wide open for how small and how inexpensive it is. But I think when you're shooting landscape, when you're shooting something that you need a little bit more in focus, uh, shooting it at maybe 2.2 or 2.8 adds a little, little more sharpness to your image. Uh, another thing to mention, I guess, when it comes to depth of field, it's also based on distance. So if somebody was standing on this side of the pool to me and I was taking their photo at f2.2, this entire background, if their head was like the size of this frame right here, the entire background would be out of focus, but because my focus point is closer to infinity, uh, there is just kind of generally more in focus. It's it's kind of the way things go. Um, to basically, to get the minimum depth of field possible, uh, say for instance, like a shot kind of like this. Um, this is also shot at two point two, but it kind of shows you how uh, a shot like this, everything seems to be in focus. Maybe. It uh, I don't even, maybe it's just moving a little bit too fast. It was a windy day. Uh, everything pretty much seems in focus at 2.2, but then as something gets closer to your frame, you can see the background starts to go a little bit out of focus at the same f-stop. So um, that's my example for that. So f2.2, shutter speed 500. And usually I'm not too careful with my ISO. I used to be very careful to leave it at exactly 100. Um, your camera will have a base ISO. It may go, go below the base ISO. So for instance, on the Nikon Z6 II, you can go to L1.0. And it's kind of an extended ISO range. It's not a real ISO necessarily. The high ISOs are the same that once you get to H1.0, it's actually just kind of taking the file that it would have taken uh, at whatever the highest ISO is, and it's artificially boosting it within the camera. It's doing essentially what you would do in Lightroom if you were just um, increasing the exposure. So shooting your base ISO is kind of best practice, but with near mirrorless cameras, I really don't see much of a problem until you get maybe above 3200 ISO. Uh, the downside technically is kind of the higher ISO you get. Obviously, the more grain you're going to get in your image, but as you can see, I've actually added a little bit of grain. I don't know if you can see it on the video, but there is a little bit of um, grain that I've added actually in post-production because I like kind of that tactile texture. Uh, but the negative is that if you get to a really high ISO, you're going to start to lose a little bit of the dynamic range that you have in post-production. So if you're trying to really increase exposure, the image is going to start to break apart in weird ways. Maybe it means banding. Maybe it means just extra noise. Um, this is what I would consider to be grain. It's monochromatic. It's not distracting. I feel like it looks nice. What noise is, is it is basically that grain, but usually in a rainbow assortment of colors that doesn't really look that great. So um, those are kind of the differences of that. So Lurking around the property, I like to just use a prime lens uh, to just kind of do all of my detail shots. And as I'm entering new environments, I'm basically just changing my shutter speed. So as you can see up here, I was at 500 and now I've moved down to 320 to let a little bit more light in now that I am in the shade. Um, that's pretty much kind of, I guess, the, the way that I mentally structure it is that I'll typically set my aperture. I'll choose an aperture. If I'm doing detail shots, exteriors, maybe I'll be at f2.2 or maybe 2.8. If I am doing portraits, I'll usually be pretty close to wide open. Open, and I will just kind of lock that off that that's where my aperture stays. Uh, my ISO also, I try to get that as low as possible. And then I just move my shutter speed. And basically as my shutter speed comes down, so say it became an even darker environment, like something like this, as soon as I get down below, I would say maybe one slash 80th of a second or around there at that point, I'll start really kind of boosting in the ISO. Uh, if you have a little bit of a shake, maybe in your hands, um, I, if I drink too many Red Bulls before going to a wedding day, I, I actually do have a, a full proper tremor. Um, and I will actually increase my shutter speed to counter for that. And I'll also be hyper aware of it when doing video because the IBIS sometimes doesn't actually get rid of that shake. So maybe don't drink too much caffeine before going to a wedding day. All right. So we already saw some of these. Um, I'll slowly kind of go through things. If there's anything that you see that you're interested in more, feel free to stop on it. But as you can see, um, a little bit of distance background is a little bit blurry. As I get closer to the subject, the background gets even more blurry and anything that's on this plane of focus. So the way that kind of focus works is that if someone, if basically if my focus line is right here, um, and I focus on his glasses or Maybe my camera attempted to focus on the eyes behind the glasses because it understands what glasses are and it offsets a little bit. Um, my focus line is going to be right on his eye line. So anything that stays on that eye line, so even if there were 10 people all lined up over here, they would all be in focus as long as their eyes were all on the same plane. So physically, if he is three point 
two feet from me, if everyone is 3.2 feet and they're in a straight line facing my camera, uh, everyone will be in focus. If I start to rotate, so say I was standing maybe two feet to the left here, and I got him in focus and there was still another 10 people standing behind, those people will get consistently more out of focus if I'm kind of shooting down a line rather than shooting at a flat uh, line of people. If that makes any sense, hopefully. So as you can see, a little bit further away, people in the background a little bit uh, more in focus here. Uh, Definitely went up on shutter speed in order to kind of capture the motion here. Um, there are times that you can use a slower shutter speed to kind of accentuate the motion. I found that in this, I kind of wanted to freeze it and shot a bunch of frames of it. Here we are in the getting ready. Um, so I'm down at aperture F2. Um, so I'm stopped down a little bit, just literally one little click um, on the back wheel, and it is at f2 wide open. It's at 1.8. Um, are you going to see much of a difference between those? Honestly, not really. For shoe photos, um, you'll notice that if you are doing photographs of things that are really high contrast, so as you can see, kind of this, um, I guess, how it's pretty much a highlight that's almost completely gone, or maybe it is completely gone, and it's stacked right beside something that's a little bit darker, the problem with that is going to be, um, to specifically if you're using a lesser quality lens, you're going to start to see some really crazy colors come out of there. It might be a green fringe or a blue fringe or a purple fringe, but you're going to see some sort of thing. You can kind of see it starting to develop, but the I don't know if it's the lens or if it's the lens with the camera. It seems to have controlled it pretty well, um, but something to be aware of if you're not shooting with... Um, Lenses that I guess maybe the, the mirrorless side of things, if you're still on digital SLR, a lot of your lenses when shot wide open will suffer from these things. So there are environments such as something like this that I think that that would be fine. I wouldn't see much of a fringe here, even though this is a highlight to a shadow. I probably wouldn't see too much there, um, but something like this on one of my old digital SLR lenses, I would definitely start to see um, some, some issues there. Again, the closer you get to somebody, the, the more out of focus. So it's at F2. As you can see, a little bit more of the background and focus here, moving into something that I just physically get a little bit closer, background disappears a little bit more. This is, uh, I guess, just hairspray or maybe makeup setter. Um, and same deal, just kind of, as you can see, all the settings have kind of remained the same that I've just set to what I think that I want, and I have just kind of locked off on that. If you are somebody that shoots aperture priority, that's fine too. Um, I just find that this is a little bit, um, I guess it, it keeps things a little bit more consistent for me. As you can see, maybe I should have stopped down a little bit to get these additional pigs in focus here. Um, so they are pretty close to the eye line of this pig, but whenever you're really, really close to subjects doing macro photos, uh, you basically have a very, very shallow depth of field. And the fact that this, this, I'm going to guess this is probably the focus point here, that this is in focus and these are out of focus because they're either a little bit too close or a little bit too far behind. One other thing I'll mention is if you are doing photos, I tend to find that out of focus elements in the foreground look very weird and distracting. Out of focus elements in the background always look nice, but try not to do something where you're taking a photo of uh, this person here uh, in the back and then you have somebody kind of in the foreground that's completely out of focus. It balances a little bit weird. And you don't have to follow everything that I do or say. It's just kind of what I like. As you can see, pretty close to starting to, or at least maybe my eyes can kind of see that this is going to slowly turn into um, kind of that highlight contrast thing where you just get some weird colors out of it. Um, I would say on any digital camera, if you are underexposing a little bit, so exposed for the highlights, make sure you retain the highlights. They're going to be a lot more brittle than your shadows. You will likely have a lot more power in your shadows if you're shooting a digital camera. All right, keeping my shutter around one slash two hundredth of a second. And you can see kind of the, the fact that I just leave that there and then I just bump the ISO a little bit. That we go into a much darker room and I just change the ISO around. Um, I don't think that there's a right or wrong way. You can change the ISO if you want or your shutter speed. I would say maybe an 800 shutter speed in here, maybe a little bit bit too high, not really necessary, but at the same time, you're not going to see any true negatives from it um, on the new cameras. I'm at f2.8 now simply because it is an f2.8 lens. Uh, this is the 70 to 200. I have switched to uh, essentially my, my dream and my goal is to be able to shoot primes all day, but realistically in a wedding day environment to be able to shoot this scene with a 50, I would have to be basically right on top of them for their first look. So I'd have to be standing like right here in order to get things or maybe over here. And especially with a bridge like this, you want the ability to zoom in case somebody turns a different way or whatever it might be. So I would say if you uh, have the budget, definitely get a, 
a 7200. If you don't have the budget, rent one. Um, you can rent one for pretty much any system, I think, now, which is really, really cool. So moving inside, ISO coming up. This is a very, very dark room, and I am at ISO 2500. And then I'm coming down to about 1000, and I think that if people are looking at the towards the window, the light is kind of coming from the, the left of this scene. If people are looking in that direction, I can be around 1000 ISO. If they're looking in the other direction, I will have to add a little bit more ISO. Uh, I'm going to leave my shutter speed around 1 slash 100th here. So as you can see, bumping the ISO up in order to balance. Um, Lighting-wise, pretty good light. Not so good light being lit by the red lanterns over here. Uh, very challenging environment and just trying to kind of do the best I can. Um, I believe that I had a flash on my camera and I was using a little bit of flash, but I find that whenever you're in these very close proximities, it's kind of annoying to just be constantly popping flashes and just kind of you very much take over the scene. So I do the best that I can to get by ambient before really bringing in a flash. Um, in the family photos we're going to see in a second, I actually brought in the flash at that point. I feel like the ambience of what actually happened also remains whenever you do leave it a little bit more ambient if possible. Um, just make sure that it is recoverable because red is, a, I guess, a color wavelength that is typically very difficult and will blow very quickly and will be a little bit difficult to recover, um, which is why this scene is pretty much the hardest that I could really imagine. I would say this is probably one of the more difficult scenes that I've ever encountered in my life as a wedding photographer. So as you can see here, um, now that people are standing in a line, you can see that out on the right, they kind of start to come in more of kind of a semicircle towards me. And because of this, and because I knew I was going to be doing a number of family photos here, I actually brought my aperture to F4. Uh, as you can see here, again, standing at that one slash 100th of a second. And I have my flash bouncing pretty much right off the ceiling above me and a little bit behind in order to light the scene as best I could. This is an example here. If if you're bouncing your flash kind of directly straight up and you're a little bit too close to your subjects, the light as you see it kind of falls a little bit weird. It's a little bit of a strange lighting pattern. As you bounce it kind of back over your shoulder or maybe you bounce it at a wall over here and the light kind of fills the, the room a little bit more naturally, you will get rid of that. It's really, really nice. All right, moving outside and doing some outdoor portraits. I am now on my 35 millimeter lens, at least for this photo and this photo only. And now onto the 7200. Um, the 7200 I like for these style of photos as well as ceremonies. Um, if you are shooting kind of a lot of different groups of people, I find that having a 7200 allows you to kind of zoom in a little bit and actually hide things if needed. Um, one thing that I didn't realize, I guess, um, was this little assist button here. Um, usually I'm pretty aware of those and I can kind of hide them behind people's heads. And as you can see, it was pretty close. I was hiding some stickers on the doors down here. So maybe I was paying a little bit too much attention to that, but having the ability to zoom in a little bit, um, as well as walking, you're able to hide more things in the background, um, which is something that's actually kind of, I don't know, it's, it's a nice to be able to do rather than Photoshopping it out later on the 35. If I could shoot all day on a 35, I feel like the images, um, to do kind of a quick lens comparison, I talked about this in the wedding photography lenses video a couple of days ago now. Uh, the I guess the benefit of shooting with a 35 or a lens that is a little bit uh, more wide angle, you really feel like you're in this scene. If I was shooting this with a 7200 and I was back across the room, it would have very nice compression out of focus areas, but it wouldn't really feel like you're there. I feel like the 35, especially at 1.8, really does feel like you're just there in the room. Again, if you see anything that interests you, feel free to stop and have a look at the settings. I'll just cycle through a few now. The reason that I changed these to black and white um, is because of the weird mixed light that was happening. Um, if you're ever in mixed lighting situations, do the best you can to fix it. If you can't really fix it, uh, it's best usually just to go black and white. Details, maybe my shutter speed is a little bit too high, but again, ISO 1000 on this camera looks exactly the same as ISO 100. Maybe not exactly if you zoom in really and intensely, but. So with my 7200, you can see even though this is a space that has a lot of natural light, 
that it is kind of dark that I'm down at f2.8 at one slash one sixtieth of a second at ISO 4000 to get a pretty close to accurate exposure. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why it is important to have a 7200 2.8 rather than the f4. Um, f4 could have got away with today. f4 in a dark church becomes very much a problem and you'll find yourself just ending up on an 85 prime a lot more often. So uh, I do recommend getting the 2.8 or renting the 2.8 if you can. Um, another, I guess, challenge here is the fact that um, while well, it's raining, so there's additional challenges on top of that, but the background is so bright and it is so dark in here. So just do the best you can to kind of balance within that. Um, again, at ISO 4000, you're starting to lose a little bit of that dynamic range. So had I been able to shoot this at F or ISO 100, I probably would have been able to balance the scene a little bit better. Um, but I think to somebody's eye, I feel like this feels natural enough. So pretty much everything at ISO 4000 and no complaints at all as far as noise or um, anything negative. Uh, so I guess it got a little bit darker. I'm now at ISO 8000. At this point, even though I'm on a 7200, 7200 kind of best practice is that if you're going to be shooting at 200, probably stay around one slash 200th of a second. Um, I will break that rule or I would have broken, this, broken that rule had I had to go up in ISO anymore. Um, but I was fine with, with, again, R6, great camera. All right. Sorry for having my mouse over that. All right, so here's an example of shooting at f2.2. Everybody is in one straight line, and everybody is nicely in focus. Um, I guess that's our only family demo. Um, actually, no, this guy's a little soft. So usually what I do in these situations is I'll actually be walking backwards and forwards a little bit um, while talking to people, so I will hopefully have a frame with him properly in focus. So yeah, if you have any questions at all about settings, feel free to chime in in the comments below. I'm happy to get back to you about them. Um, I would say for the most part, make sure that if you are shooting with a shallower depth of field, that both of the people or all of the people that you want to be in focus are all on that same focus plane. So everyone is lined up kind of perfectly. Um, even in a situation like this, shooting at 1.4, because I'm a little bit further away, it's close enough. So even though they're not on the exact same focus plane, um, I do have a little bit of leverage uh, or a little bit of, I guess, additional depth. If they were, um, or if I was maybe five steps closer and also maybe a little bit more to my left and I was focused here, uh, Yuji would likely be pretty soft or the other way around that if I was focused on her, that anyone standing in the foreground is going to be very out of focus at that point. In the reception, um, so I've now switched to actual um, fluorescent white balance in this scene uh, because all of the lights around here were very, um, they don't look green in real life. So you walk into a room, you're like, this looks like it's just white. And then you take a few photos and they're not looking right. Cycle through your white balances. There's probably also a good chance that within your white balances, you have additional options specifically for fluorescence. There might be an up arrow or a down arrow or a side arrow or something to, to select more options. But for fluorescent, there is usually kind of a default and there's like a green and like a halogen. There's all kinds of, I think I have like 10 different options on some cameras. Um, as well as when you're on automatic white balance, you may have a setting to either preserve kind of overall look and feel of the scene or to balance for specifically white. And I believe that Nikon has an additional one that's actually to, to balance for the, the warm tones and actually warm the image up, um, which is usually what I would shoot on when I was on a Nikon camera. And that's all for the settings. Thank you so much for joining me here 
on the wedding photography settings video. I hope this helps. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments below. I can usually get back to most questions. And if you're on a camera system that I'm not familiar with, usually somebody can help you out in the comments as well. And lastly, I want to thank Focal. Uh, if you're interested in getting a website, head on over to the link in the description below and put your name on the wait list. In this current month of January, if you sign up, they're actually waiving the $900 plus setup fee. Uh, they literally make your website for you and hand you the keys. Uh, so that's usually what that $900 fee is for. You will actually get a full first draft of your website, which in my experience is pretty much a final website. And you can go and you can make some small adjustments. And again, they work with you to actually create a custom website for you, which is really, really amazing. It also comes with a full customer backend that you can do contracts and accept bookings. And there's an availability calendar. And uh, over the next year, there's a lot more coming as well. Um, that the system, if you kind of get locked in now, the system's only going to get better over time, which is really, really cool. And if you have any suggestions for what you would like, uh, honestly, just email them and tell them or put send me a message here and I can relay that to the team. And the idea is basically to make the focal system as valuable for photographers and exactly what we need um, rather than something like a honey book that is great but not really 100% designed just specifically for photographers. So Focal is kind of one of those things that just will hopefully do everything that you need from a photography business rather than having like 10 different things to do just what one system could do as far as like having uh, PayPal checkout that if, oh, you want to pay credit card, okay, head on over to this PayPal link and uh, check it through this invoice and then you have to put that somewhere else and then you're tracking in like an Excel spreadsheet or something. Uh, it's easier just to go this way. So head on over there and get that free website set up if you're interested uh, this, this month only. So if you're watching this outside of January, I'm sorry, but if you're watching this in January, I don't know. You're welcome, I guess. I, I'm not building a website. So I feel weird kind of accepting any thanks from it, but um, hopefully you do find it helpful and they are the company that I'm using for my website now. That's all. I'll see you again tomorrow. Don't forget to subscribe and turn the bell on and I will see you again in 24 hours.